This podcast is brought to you by the School of Advanced Study, University of London. This is indeed an honour, a real honour, because our, 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 our keynote speaker today is living history, real history. <coughs> He's took so many people, him, him and his wife Jessica, have made a difference. Their, their, their work is celebrated in the archives, in the uh, London Metropolitan Archives. And he's, he's going to share with us today his journey, part of his journey. His journey is also being celebrated today in the exhibition No Color Bar. I'm going to ask the hands up who's been to see No Color Bar. Wow, you've all got a treat. This is a stunning exhibition. It celebrates Eric's life, the, the work that he's done. The work that he's done, the contribution he's made is, is uh, to, to, to black British history. And the thing that I love about Eric, the thing I really love about Eric, is about his focus on culture, poetry, literature. Those things, uh, the, the, those things that, that some people think, oh, this is not for black people. But he's actually, he's actually created a black British culture, which is celebrated, not just in this exhibition, but in the lives of so many people, myself included. So I'd like to invite Derek up to the, um, Derek, Eric. <laughs> I'd, like to, I'd like to invite him to the stage. So we don't see them on television, um, we, we don't see them on the news, and um, both she and Eric are those kind of people. When I think about the impact of uh, Jessica and Eric's work, uh, it's quite strange because I come from a back to front perspective. Uh, I heard the word before I heard equals so the word was legendary. Uh, a way of introducing me to a rich field of, of African history. And uh, what was quite unique about it is because I have continental heritage, I'm, I'm a Yoruba man, it, it was refreshing to see African people from the diaspora coming and talking about our culture, our history, with a level of knowledge, of sensitivity, um, of academic vigor, um, and not being ashamed of it. And I don't think we'll get to the full extent of the impact right now. But she, what they have done is lay a very solid foundation. Foundation of activism, foundation of love, foundation of culture, foundation of writing and academia. They've covered a, a wide spe spectrum of different things. nationalists, but fully understood that oppression is global. Uh, what people do in one country impacts upon others elsewhere. Um, and so the notion of working to eliminate injustice in their own country uh, was for them something that could not be achieved unless they had a concern about injustice everywhere. When they came to London, they were already seasoned, informed, political activists, analysts, politicians, and many things, and many things that. And they simply carried on the struggle for human decency in a different place.
contribution of Jessica and Eric on many levels. I knew about the um, contribution to the world of literature, which is something that I personally hold dear in involved in education. They, my feeling is that they brought books that were not available elsewhere to a general public, to a public in, in England that was gasping and dying for information. And just for that alone, they earn an respect. As a couple, I mean, you can see, for example, the bookshop was central and publishing was central to the activity. All their, whatever their public political activism might have manifested itself, the ways it manifested itself, publishing was the core work. Bob Lerner was a publisher, you know, that book. It didn't mean anything to me at the time. But I'm saying that to say that Mama Jessica and of course, indeed, um, her, her, her king and, and consort, uh, Baba Eric, uh, were having an impact on my life in that moment when I bought that book. And the many, many moments I've spent leafing through the pages of that book, had it not been for them, I would not have been connected with profound knowledge and information about a very, very important and fundamental part of my history.
and then he, he told us about it, and then we went to um, to check it out, <coughs> and hence we were able to move from Cody Shaw Road to Chicken Place, a move which we were, we were really unprepared for, even though in the long run it worked out very well, it was a very good move, but um, in the short run it, um, it pressured the, the, the new company how to finance it and to and how to survive it. So the early days was very, very difficult because we wanted to pay for The first publication, Roundings with My Brothers, um, took place after a group of meetings at 110 in the Mayor Road, which was held in the dining room and the sitting room of our, of our house. We lived in the flat with two children, so it was very tight. And meetings were held um, <coughs> in the dining room. And um, at first, as I said, it, it, um, it was grounded with my brothers was published as a pamphlet on a guest statement. And then we decided to print it. And we were very fortunate in, in um, having the recommendation of John Rose who had published his first book, he recommended us John, John Sankey, a various publication in North London, who, um, who was very, um, very adventurous as a, as a printer, uh, in, in the sense that he allowed us to make a deposit on the books and to give us small amounts of books. When we sold the books, but then we could get some more. But when the book, when Grump with my, with my brothers first arrived, um, in those days, the, the ink which was used, you can smell the ink on new publications, and even newspapers, you can smell the ink. And so when it arrived, um, the group all gathered around and passed copies um, from one person to another. And uh, it was like a, the, the christening or a, a new baby being passed from godfather to godmother or aunties and uncles, sharing the joy of the arrival of this new baby. Uh, unfortunately, um, one of the sad notes about, it, about this baby was the fact that it becomes spine. And we didn't regard ourselves as publishers unless the book had a spine. Because in the bookshops, books were displayed not front of them, it was displayed on shelves with a spine. So you needed to have a spine with a name on it so the customers can see it and buy it. So we, we rectified that um, the omission with the second publication. It means that it means a spine, okay? a book would have to be of a certain thickness and a certain size to have a spine. So the size is increased with a spine, and so we rectified that. But it was, um, and of course, when we sent it to, um, to Walter, Walter was really over the moon about it. He was very pleased with the publication. And I believe that. Um, what, he, what he saw that this group was capable of doing with Brownings gave him the confidence to, uh, to give us the, uh, the, the manuscript of the, his real uh, book, How You Are About to Tell Africa. He felt much more confidence that the group can really handle it. The benefits of having the bookshop is that um, it attracted um, uh, lots of academics who who, um, who had read and would recommend it or Europe on the Africa to be on the on the on the curriculum for the for, for, for black studies and for the uh, for the university work. But what it also did is that it brought um, Samuel Selborne, for example, from Trinidad who wrote Lord Road Lord in London, which was very popular in those days. Andrew Solity, um, uh, who was very um, close to us, who was a founder member of Book Literature. Uh, many of, uh, of his books had an outlet. Um, Valerie Bloom from Jamaica, um, in a poetry touch me, tell me. Uh, Lyndon Cressy Johnson had um, his Dread Beaten Bird, did workshops with him at the bookshop. Um, Ellen Koswaya um, from, from, from South Africa came over. The Women's Press was there, Women's Press was really uh, um, a whole host of um, you know, writers from Africa, the Caribbean, 
and the Americas. The experiences at the bookshop, the workshops which we had at book launches. At that time, we had how Europe on the developed Africa, and, and we had brownies with my brothers, which meant that people from all over, particularly from the States and Africa, came to the bookshop. If we didn't have a bookshop, it became like a center that, that, that people can come to, a window to the world, you know, to say. The bookshop um, had books in it, so in that sense it was a bookshop. But after a while, it became more, more of a, an advice center, a cultural center, um, a, set, a place where persons can come in and chat about what's happening in the Caribbean, what's happening overseas, what's happening with the family, um, where jobs are where they're there, how can they get a job uh, accommodation, because there weren't any citizen advice bureau in those days. So the bookshop um, become, and responded with, uh, compared to North London and other areas, West London was really a, a, really a desert, nothing much took place in West London. So the bookshop became really a cultural center, like a haven, an oasis in West London, really speaking. Um, in, in time, of course, we, we, um, we were able to launch new books, and which was, which looking back at it now, we were really pioneers because British publishers never launched the books in the 1960s and 70s. You know, it's a modern, it's a modern thing which emerged maybe, maybe in the 1980s and so on. One of the things we pioneered is, 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 um, is um, making contact with schools and encouraging schools to take part in what is happening in the community. This is something which is accepted now and uh, organizations and groups go into schools and uh, have workshops and so on. It didn't happen in the 1960s and 70s. We, we, the teachers brought children, pupils into the, into the workshop, and we had workshops, drumming workshops, poetry sessions, um, uh, book launches, and they were all free. We didn't charge, we didn't charge schools. So we pioneered that extramural activity of the community relating with the book, with, with, um, with schools. It didn't happen in those days at all. We were part, we became part of the Black Fairs movement, which was formed in 1974, and uh, which, which emerged out of um, the arrest of um, Cliff McDaniel, who was a student in, in North London. And out of that campaign to, to get him they get them free to be released. Uh, the Black Bears movement was formed, it was raised to be collective. Um, New Beacon, Black Bears movement, and of course, Bogolo the Children. And one of the things that um, sometimes you wonder, because just those hardly, or very often, hardly at the bookshop, because they were campaign, she would have, she would have gone to, um, to Hackney, she would have gone to Notting Hill, Manchester, um, different parts of the country. Police would frame people, the, the youngsters would have been arrested. <coughs> there were a lot of court cases taking place. And so the Black Bears movement had a strategy of traveling to these various places and advising, preparing the case, because you couldn't depend upon the lawyers to defend you. We prepared the cases, interviewed, interviewed the um, witnesses, interview their views and then discuss it with the, with the, with the solicitors. We, we prepare the case for the solicitors rather than leaving it up to the solicitors to do it. And this is what this is done just, of course, with race today, John the Rose and New Beacon, and um, race today, traveled up and down the country. So the bookshop became uh, an a extra mural, extra curricular activities to operating a business. Thank you very much for listening and for agreeing that. Look, 
I don't think too much of people can hear you. Okay. Sorry? Too much of people can hear you. Okay. Thank you very much for being here. And thank you, Michael. Can you hear me? Yes. We would like to leave some time for um, for questions. So I thought I'll um, say, a few, begin to say a few words now. Um, I'd like to th I'd like to to express my sincere appreciation for the Institute of Commonwealth Studies, and in particular. Michael Mahatru, for this invitation to speak. Permit me to, a measure of indulgence in attempting to answer the question of who I am. My birth certificate reads Limburg Huntley. However, for most of my life, I have been known as Eric Huntley. I believe it was traditional to give a, a, fund, a fond name to newborn babies, and hence the name of Eric. Both Eric and Lindbergh are, I understand, of Scandinavian origin. <laughs> Lindbergh was the pilot who strung solo across the Atlantic from the United States of America, and my father must have been impressed by this act. It must have provided him with some optimism, so much needed during the 1920s a time of growing unemployment. The surname Huntley is Scottish. It is, as is evident to all who are here today, my physical appearance is that of an African origin. In the 50s, I've, I must make a confession here that I find it very difficult to use the pronoun I. I've, we've been married for, 20, over, for 23 years, passed away two years ago, so very often I speak as though we are one, which you can understand. In the 50, in the 50 years, my wife and I finally left the shores of Ghana, the fabled city of El Dorado, for the streets of London, which proverbially are paved with gold. As a child growing up in Georgetown, I was conscious of the role of gold played in our daily lives. Gold found its way as bangles and rings, and much later, it adorned the teeth of men and women too, who when they smiled or laughed, exhaled the billions of glittering gold. It was also used as a source of savings for a rainy day. The pawn shops thrived on all aspects of the mineral. When a child was born, it was obligatory to give a, 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 a bangle or a ring in Guyana, at least, there was some truth in the myths, in the myth of El Dorado. It was not so in London. Knighted by the Queen of England, Sir Walter Raleigh was responsible throughout the centuries for perpetuating the myth that the land of Guyana was the location of El Dorado, the city of gold. Perhaps it is no wonder that he met his death. He was hanged. I am also a Guyanese of West Indian origin. The first mention of the expression West Indian took place in the respectable tea, tea houses and ale houses and town houses of London. The ale houses, along with the ports and docks of London, came alive with the arrival of the, and departure of ships to the Americas and <coughs> Africa. Prominent among the customers were the insurance brokers who traded in slaves, as well as silk sugar, tobacco, and tropical produce. Those involved in the triangular trade captured and enslaved slaves, took them to the islands, and then sailed back to London. They became known as West Indians, or the West Indian lobby, or the West Indian interest. At the height of their influence of this group, they were undoubtedly the richest and the most influential, controlling 50 to 60 seats in Parliament. 
This allowed them not only to retard the progress of the campaign against the slave trade and abolition of the system, but also the movement for the electoral reform in England. To this day, the region appears quite content with the name which was used to describe us by slave owners, rather than adopting the name Caribbean after the name of the sea which runs through the region. The region is neither in the West nor in the Indies. Christopher Columbus will be excused. We grew up in Guyana during the 1940s. This was a time when faced with the interaction of labor force on the sugar estates and the impact of the Second World War, the descendants and pioneers who founded the villages of freed Africans took the pioneering spirit of their forebears to the interior of the country to mine for gold and diamonds. And they were called oak knockers, whose main diet of protein came from salted pork and salted fish shipped mainly from North America in barrels of brine. The result of their hard labor found its way into the hands of Portuguese merchants, many of whom in time owned the shops, provided credit for the miners, and also owned the jewelry and pawn shops in the city. The pioneers helped to rescue the economy, built homes in their respective villages, and nurtured a generation of scholars who eventually found their way into professional teaching, law, school, church, and other careers. Both Jessica and I finished our primary education during the 40s, now age 16. We were both ready for the labor market. The war years had the effect of cutting off supplies of imports from overseas, giving rise to local initiatives, and one of these was the making of shirts. Jessica joined the Bayana Shirt Factory, a firm which was owned by the descendants of Portuguese immigrants. A pupil with school leaving certificate could be expected to have a job in the office. Jessica was literate and numerate. She was employed in the factory making cardboard boxes. The office was of, out of bounds to black people. She later went on to become the spokesperson of employees during a labor dispute over wages. My family lived in Yom Sudan, the second largest town in Guyana. My father, a prison warden, socialized with other government workers, and I was able to obtain a job as a telegraph messenger at the post office. Contrary to the experience of most of the region, all employees of the service started as a messenger, later becoming a postman and eventually, through a series of exams, postal clerks could become a postmaster. During my growing up years, as well as starting my first job as a messenger in the post office, I was not exposed to reading outside a few textbooks and at school. There were hardly any books at home, except the Bible. I never joined a public library. However, my first exposure to the world of books came when I began to import books of classical British authors from the United States. They were 25 cents each, and I sold them to civil servants who worked in the compound of government buildings in Amsterdam. In 1951, I was a postman living and working in the village of Buxton, named after one of the British activists who supported the struggles of my enslaved ancestors. This act of naming the village after him was in recognition of his contribution towards abolition in the trade of slaves. Government workers were paid monthly. I was by that time married, with Jessica, married to Jessica and together with a son, Carl. Our existence was what was known colloquially as hand to mount. I found myself at the major, I found myself at the major store called Booker's in Georgetown and purchased a flatbed duplicating machine for the sum of my month's salary. For the rest of my of that month, we had nothing to eat. And I produced a post office workers journal where I worked. 
Three years after that, the security forces, the, the constitution was suspended, and the security forces raided my home and seized my duplicating machine. During the 50s, the Trinidadian author and Marxist theorist C.R.R. James wrote a pamphlet entitled Every Cook in Govern, a study of democracy in ancient Greece. He used the experience of those early attempts to build a democratic society with that of the possibility of the American Negroes struggling to and to cope with life in racist America. I mention it, although the concept is worthy of debate, I, was, I will add that not every cook becomes a chef. In order to make a point, in Guyana during the 50s, at the time of political activism, the chefs comprised of middle class professionals, retail merchants, and government employees. One can now appreciate the reason why our parents then and now take advantage of the higher educational possibilities that society has to offer. The reason is that this provides one with some measure of independent livelihood, very important in a society where the main employers are expatriate businesses and government. One of the many consequences of the government assault on the democratic process in 1953 was that the blows fell more severely on the few chefs who had little or nothing to fall back on, the resources of the family unit. Chefs like Jessica and I had no alternative to migrate. To remain would have put us at the vagaries of political climate and economic dependence on our limited family's resources. Every decade generates its own energy. The 60s witnessed the birth in London of not one, but three publishers. New Beacon Books was established in 1966 by John Rose, Alison and Busby, for, um, was followed, and uh, of course, Bogle Overture came after. Bogle Overture saw the light of day in 1968. These developments did not take place in Trinidad, Ghana, or Guyana, the lands of their respective birds of their founders, but in London, the colonial capital of imperious country, which ruled supreme over a vast empire that included the birthplace of the publishers. London was in fact no stranger to the industry of publishing by persons of African origin. These, however, had been mainly newspapers and pamphlets, pioneers of an independent voice of African concerns. What were the circumstances which gave rise to the voices on the printed page during the 60s? John de Rose of New Beacon Books, born in Trinidad, said, growing up in a colonial society, he was acutely aware that the colonial policy was based on a deliberate withholding of information from, from the population. There was discontinuity of information from generation to generation. Publishing, therefore, was a vehicle to give an independent validation to one's own culture, history, politics, and a sense of worth. New Beacon Books owed its name to a magazine called The Beacon in his native Trinidad. His, his first publication was his own collection of poetry. And shortly after, John Rose founded the Caribbean um, Artist Movement, as well as a bookshop specializing in African and Caribbean literature. Alison and Busby was founded out of the belief that some important books were not being published by the existing publishing industry in the United Kingdom. The pricing of most books with expensive hardbacks meant that important writings were not reaching the widest possible audience. And Alison Busby sought to change this by publishing these important works, making them <coughs> more affordable and accessible to a wider audience. Margaret Busby, who is in the audience, explains, we had no money nor experience, but plenty of useful ideals and a conviction 
that we could change the world. After the cheap poetry title in 1967, the first novel we published was in 1969, was Sam Greenlee's The Spook Who Sat By The Door, which had been turned down by everyone on both sides of the, of the Atlantic as subversive. But we borrowed the money to take it on, doing everything ourselves. I and his Margaret edited it and did the jacket with letter We persuaded the observer to print extracts, got it widely reviewed, and sold translation rights around the world. Someone once said to me, that's Margaret, you never know what Alison and Buzzy was going to do next, but you knew it was going to be interesting. Bogle on the other hand, owes his birth to the Rastafarian brethren, the students, both secondary and, and, um, and university, and the struggling <coughs> poor who took to the streets of their capital in protest after the banning of Walter Rodney from the end of Jamaica. Rodney was a lecturer in African history and left the island to attend the Black Writers Conference in Canada. The demonstration paid a very heavy price. Five persons were killed by the police who sought to prevent them from protesting. On learning of this atrocity, a group of concerned West Indians in the United Kingdom could not sit back and be satisfied with protesting against the ban as was done in America. The case of the government against Rodney could be summed up by the Minister O'Neill who described him as the most dangerous man. In, in that, for this reason, we sought to tell the truth about the reason <coughs> why water was, um, was banned. And therefore, we printed ground beans from my brothers. After the demonstration, a group of concerned West Indians met at our home at 110 Windermere Road. And uh, of course, the group developed themselves into a self-publishing company. And uh, the, the, the groundings with my brothers was the result of that, of, um, that, that, that meeting. The name of Bogle, Bogle was um, suggested by Chris Lemon, by no, Bogle, no, um, Toussaint, no, Chris, Le, Chris Lament suggested the name of Toussaint Louverture, whereas Bogle was suggested by Richard Small. And so we combined the two names in order to make, to make sense of it, Bogle Louverture. Having decided on the name, the question of finance was the, main, was the major issue which we had to deal with. Most of the, those persons present were students and uh, working and, st and studying. And the, the suggestion was made that we should um, contact a group of white people who we knew for, for, um, for a loan or for um, financial support. And Jessica was very clear on this. She said, we don't want to depend on white people. We're going to depend on our own people. And she immediately telephoned RBO Hart, and he offered to pay to give, to give a loan or a grant of £100. And that was how we began to publish in um, publish Groundings with My Brothers. Jessica, as she was the main female member of the group, and she would have been expected to operate the duplicating machine, which would be a very messy operation at the best of times. Printing the talks commercially would relieve her of an unwelcome task. It was under those circumstances that the birth of the new publishing house was born. Although the late 60s and 70s were times when the fulfillment of dreams and aspirations seemed possible, there was much of the residue of the impact of enslavement in the spirit and self-worth. Black was not regarded as beautiful. The images of black people on posters and cards that we published were not always appreciated and were all welcome. It took some time before the full impact of what was taking place in Africa, the United States of America, and the diaspora to become evident. One of 
the publications which which certainly made it national, international um, news was the publication of Dread Beaten Blood. It was first published in 1975. In this collection, Linton captures the experiences and the frustrations and pain felt by large sections of the black population. The author, by his use of strict idiom, gives validation to the experimentation of language as a means of expressing the impact of conditions faced by black people, especially the youth in the streets of London. Poetry, like music, has the power to move with their listener or the reader. And nowhere was this most evident than at the evening of poetry held at the London Town Hall, at the Camden Town Hall in 1981. This was one of the events organized by the International Fair of Radical Black and Third World Books. The stage on that evening was filled with many poets from five continents. However, the star of the firmament was that of Mighty Smith, who tragically was killed after his return to Jamaica. Such highlights are, of course, exceptional. Publishers like ourselves during this period are constantly torn between publishing quantities so as to keep the price per copy as low as possible, while at the same time, having to keep a storage of stock books and of old copies. Fortunately, recent developments in technology have made it possible for publishers to print quantity based on demand. <clears throat> we did not neglect the needs of the young people. Growing up and attending <coughs> national school during the 70s, our daughter Akabe like so many readers, would draw traits of children with European features and hair to represent themselves. We encouraged her to use colored crayons and, and the which we were imported from the United States, which represented all the complexion of persons you can imagine. And later we published a coloring book written and illustrated by Phyllis and Bernard Cord, telling the story of how the diverse communities of persons found themselves in the group. <coughs> in doing so, children from an early age were given a sense of their own place in the world, which was missing and neglected by both parents as well as the educational system. 